Welcome. I'm, we've been on a series here for a little while, just a couple of weeks. It was an unintended series. I just started teaching on different books, different proverbs, and so uh, got on a bit of a roll. So I've got another proverb for you. Is that okay? Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's good to have my wife back. She took um, Alyssa, my, our daughter, and Brooke, our daughter-in-law, to Chicago because our granddaughters both turned five. And so she took them to American Doll. Oh my gosh, I'm too scared to ask how much this cost me. Uh, all I know is they loved it beyond words and I'm going to pay American Doll to forbid their ever entering that store ever again. And I think it'll cost me less money if I do that than I ever let them ever go back there again. Praise the Lord. So in the meantime, I've been just having a great time. I've eaten at Subway. I've eaten at the back deck. I've eaten Havana's. I'm telling you, I've eaten healthier. But no, that's not true. Um, okay, you ready for this? Yeah. Ready for the word? Yeah. Do we, how many are loving the summer? I am loving it. I went offshore fishing this week. Had an opportunity to go out 60 miles offshore um, with a guy I know, a local captain. We went out. And I caught, Toby, you'll be pleased to hear this. I prayed, I prayed, I had four people on the boat, and I said, Lord, I prayed that everybody catches the biggest fish they've ever caught in their lives. How many think that's a good, how many are gl glad to hear your pastor is praying that anyone fishing with me catches the biggest fish they've ever caught in the, how many would like your pastor to pray that prayer for you? All right, a few of you, I put your hand up. Then I just add to that prayer, and Lord, let mine be that little bit bigger. <laughs> well, Toby, I caught, Toby, Toby, I caught an almost world record tilefish. It was a few pounds below the world record tilefish. And once again, my prayers have <laughs> backed me up. And I am so proud of that. I invited Toby to come with me, but he doesn't want to come because he hates the fact that I always catch the biggest fish. I just want to tell you, Toby, that's pride. You need to humble yourself. <laughs> oh, dear. It was a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of miles offshore, the rudder broke. And so I, went, I was out at 4 a.m. I didn't get home till 10.30 p.m. But I got to tell you, it was the best day I've had in months being out there on the Ocean. Robert Cameron, you were with me. How's your leg, Robert? Are you doing okay? Still there? Kind of hurt himself getting out of the boat. Is that a true story, Robert? Yep. Okay. That was a reluctant admission, but it was an admission nonetheless. Okay. Proverbs 27 verse 12. This is the first proverb we did two weeks ago. The prudent man sees danger and takes refuge. In other words, a man of discernment, a man of wisdom, a man of foresight can see if he keeps going down this road, it's going to hurt him. So he'll change course, whatever that road is. Maybe it's the way in which you do business. Maybe it's the way in which you talk to people in relationships and you realize if I keep doing this, it's going to give me harm. Maybe it's a habit that you have created that you need to uncreate. Is that such a word? Um, what's the right word? We'll go with that. That's a good word. And, uh, or maybe it's just something that you can see. It's a friendship. And the long-term effect of this, you need to actually, you see danger coming in that friendship. Maybe it's an inappropriate friendship. Very quiet here. Okay, and sees danger coming and you take refuge. You do something about it. Whereas the simple man keeps going and pays the penalty. That was the first proverb. The second proverb was, a generous person will prosper and he who refreshes others will be refreshed. If you weren't here, you need to get those on our, on our what is it, on the app. You can go to the Wave Church app and you can get those messages. I gotta tell you, good teaching. If I, I, I would go to this church to sit under that kind of teaching. Praise the Lord. It's good to know your pastor at least thinks he's doing okay. Um, okay, here's the proverb for today. You ready for this one? Proverbs 24, verse 10. If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? If you falter 
in a time of trouble, in a hard time, if you give up, if you lose heart, if you stay down, if you give in, in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? I remember the only time in my Christian life um, that God ever spoke to me when I prayed and I said, God, what's going on in my life? That we had, Cheryl and I, we called it the year from hell. Now, in all honesty, um, looking back of what was then the year from hell, it's all relative because when you live a few more decades, you would pay to have that year from hell <laughs> compared. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, if that was the year from hell, that's heaven. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Give me that year from hell. I'll have that again. But at the time, it was a really challenging challenging time. And so I remember, I said, God, what's going on? I even had some well-meaning Christians say to me, you must have sin in your life that all these bad things are happening. And I felt like now I know how Job felt. You know, Job's comforters. And they just went straight there down the road of legalism and judgment. And, uh, and I went, we're friends like you. Who needs enemies? Um, Mike, you weren't one of them. You'd be pleased to know Praise the Lord, you, you weren't one of them. And, uh, and so he gave me this verse. He said, read Proverbs 24, verse 10. I didn't know what Proverbs 24, it's not as if he quoted a verse I was familiar with. And so I opened up my, only time this has ever happened in my whole Christian life. And I read that verse. Now, keep in mind, I'm praying, God, what's going on? Why is all this happening to me? And I honestly think, when I read the verse, I looked up to heaven and said, oh, wait a minute, sorry, forgot, got to change mics. I looked up to heaven and I said, really, God? That's all you got? You're telling me I'm being a big baby and man up? You're telling me suck it up? You're telling me it isn't that hard? You're telling me that if I want to give in on this, that basically I'm a weakling? And is it clear? It's like God was going, mm-hmm. <laughs> that is exactly what you need to know. And I've got to tell you, I love this verse because never before and ever since has God ever just given me a rainbow verse without even knowing where the rainbow verse was or what the rainbow verse was. But the moment I read it, I got it. God's speaking to me. Steve, you can handle this. Steve, this is not going to be the end. Now, it was honestly a rough year. It was, if I, my, I don't have time to go through all the things that happened, but it was probably the most challenging year of our ministry life and stuff that had nothing to do with our decisions, but just stuff that's happening around that affected us. Have you got it? So I just want to just give you a couple of thoughts here. Number one, we will all falter. I just want to put it out there. There's not a person in this room who will not want to feel like they want to give up. There's not a person here that is exempt from challenges in life. And I just want to make it very clear that even in this moment of faltering, it's meant to reveal something. It's meant to be a self-examination moment. In the moment, matter of fact, let me give you a couple of verses here. I love this verse in... Uh, and it says, uh, Proverbs 24, verse 16. For though the righteous falls, listen to this, not once, not twice, seven times they rise again. For though the righteous falls seven times, they will rise again. Can I tell you, there's not a person in this room who will not trip who will not fall over, whether that's spiritually, whether that's emotionally, whether that's physically, whatever it is, there will be times in our life where we have setbacks. And for us to not think that that's a reality puts us in a bubble that when we do fall, we feel like we've failed so much more. But the Bible says the righteous man, though he falls seven times, will rise again. I remember Josh this morning is preaching at Seaboard. So, you know, he's not backslidden. He's still a Christian. Um, he's down at Seaboard Road this morning preaching. But I remember Josh was going through a particularly hard time in soccer. And, uh, you know, he, he used to, if, he, if someone got the ball off him, 
he would, and this is when he's younger, um, he would pretend that he fell over so that it didn't look like it was his fault. That, you know what I mean? Like, and the soccer players, they, I think they take acting lessons on, on this. I think they're just brilliant at drama. Probably one of the most annoying sports in all the, all the world is soccer. Um, but I do enjoy it because my boys got into it and now I like it. But I remember, I said, Josh, if you fall down, you got to get back up. And you got to get back up like a jackrabbit. You, I mean, and there are times when someone will trip you, but I noticed, and he wanted to just give up. And I remember every time when I drive him to the, uh, to the field, I would play, this is back in the day when we had cassette players, and I'd play in the car the song, I get knocked down, but I get up again. And I just, come on, Josh, this is our theme song. You're not going to get, you, you will get knocked down, but don't stay down. Get up fast and get the ball back. And I remember I was putting that, and, and there's another song, Ain't No One Gonna Break My Stride. Ain't No One Gonna Slow Me Down. Oh, no, I got to keep on moving. And I'm trying to put that, because you will, if you get on the field and you do life, you will fall. You will trip. You will stumble. You will lose your mojo. It is going to happen. Maybe it's in your family. And maybe you've got disappointment with your kids. And you suddenly start to give up on yourself as a parent. And you start thinking to yourself, I'm the worst parent in all the world. Can I tell you? Get back up. Keep on parenting. Keep on praying. Keep on believing God. The thing that the enemy wants to do most of all is to get you to stay down. Because if you stay down, listen to me, you're no longer a threat. But if you get back up and you keep on parenting, you keep on praying, the breakthrough's gonna come. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe you employed somebody and they, that you really put them in a position of trust in your company and they really failed you and they wronged you. And you just kind of feel like you've lost your confidence in who you can choose and who you can pick and you just want to give up. Can I tell you, keep on leading your business. Hey, I want you to hear it. If you falter, I want you to, Isaiah 40 verse 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Watch. He will not grow tired or weary. He won't. And his understanding, no one can fathom. Watch. He gives strength to the weary. What does he do? He gives strength strength to the people who are faltering, who are tired. He gives strength and increases the power of the weak. So if you're in a place where you feel like you are just got no strength and you feel like you got no power, you are a perfect candidate for the creator of the universe who never gets tired to give you strength. <laughs> Even yous grow tired and weary. And young men, this is John, it's not a young man's game here. God says even young people, even young people. Now, I've been, I've been, for the last six months, I've been back in the gym and I've been working out four days a week and I like to think I'm getting stronger. But yesterday, I thought to myself, I'm gonna get on the jet ski. Now, I did go to the gym for two hours, had a pretty intense workout, I might add. Um, and then I thought, I'm gonna go over to the Narrows and lay out on the beach. The only problem is when I lay down on the beach, the tide went out. And now I had to put my jet ski back in to the water. This is after being two hours in the gym. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm young. Why are you laughing? And I had to pick up this 600 pound jet ski and I'm telling you, I almost passed out trying to put that thing back in the water. So when I read this verse, I feel good. Even yous shall get tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But watch this. But those who hope, whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. I want to tell you today, number one, you will have times where you falter. You will fall down. And I'm here today under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to tell you, get back up. Get back up. Come on. The, the, the righteous man, though he falls seven times, he will rise again. It says here, they will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run 
and not grow weary. I've never, never, ever felt that feeling. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And they will walk and not faint. Matter of fact, um, Bill, I just felt like all week I've been praying for you. And I felt like the Lord gave me a word for you. And I just, that scripture there, I want to speak it into you. That they that wait upon God will renew their strength. I just felt like the Holy Spirit all week, you've been on my heart in a good way. Not like I'm worried about you, but in a good way where God was encouraging me to encourage you. Don't throw away your confidence, which has its reward. And it's a good reward. And I just want to say to you in God, listen to me, that your best days are still in front of you. And I just really want to say to you in God, don't lose your confidence. God is with you. God is for you. And God strengthens you. And the greatest weapon you have is your confidence. Don't throw it away. It has a good reward for you in Jesus' name. And that scripture there, they that wait upon the Lord. Shall, you, this man is one of the most daring, gutsy men I've ever met. And we're not young as we used to be, are we, Bill? You're a little more than I am. And I just all week felt the Holy Spirit just keep telling me, and I found myself just speaking those verses. And I said, Lord, if Bill's in church this morning, not that I wouldn't think you wouldn't be, I really want to share that with him. You're the first person I saw when I walked in here. I want to tell you, Bill, don't throw away your confidence. It has a great reward in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand. So here's my thought when I read this problem. Don't wait until trouble comes to find out how strong you are. Did you hear it? Don't wait until trouble comes till you figure this out. The Bible says, listen to it again. I want you to hear this proverb. It's a great proverb. If you faint, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength. So here's the thought. Why don't we ahead of time sharpen our axe head? Why don't we, before this trouble, do things to make sure that we are sharp? So when trouble comes... When, when we want to falter, we have already preventatively done something about it. Would you say amen to that? Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10. For if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, much more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. I had the pleasure of actually eating some of the fish I caught this week. And uh, I, had, I had two knives. I had one knife. Um, which desperately needs sharpening. And I tried to cut these fish, these fillets, with my blunt knife. And not only much more strength is needed, um, it didn't cut anywhere near as good. And it was jagged. It was, I was losing a lot of meat. And then I went, finally, I gotta get my, my new knife that I just bought that's sharp. And I gotta tell you what a difference it made trying to get the bone out of that tile fish, which it has a little bit of, you know what I'm talking about. And so I, I just wanna say to you, life gets easier if you sharpen yourself. And if you sharpen yourself proactively, and you sharpen yourself in a preventative means and measure, I want to tell you, when the challenges comes, it will be easier in Jesus' name. So then I started thinking, well, what makes us dull? What dulls us? How do we lose our sharp edge? Well, number one, I want to say it, not going to church will make you a very dull Christian. Thank you for the under... You're all here. You should be agreeing. And everybody online, I'm telling you, you're as much a part of this service, but I'm talking about the people who come once a month and think that's a good Christian behavior. Not being a person who's regularly in the house of God will make you a very dull person. I don't mean dull in personality. I mean dull in the edge of your sharpness. Are you hearing me? No word, not being in the word, will keep you dull. Amen. No Christian friends will make sure that you're dull. No joy will make sure that life for you is hard. You're not doing things to refresh yourself. You're not doing things to keep your life on a growth track. I love, I was reading this week um, in Acts and I was reading about Peter. And, and Peter was dull in an era of his life. You would think Peter, the guy who preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved, you're telling me he was dull? There was an area in Peter's life where he was dull. And yet, thank God, he had this moment of growth. Even the apostle Peter 
had a significant change of view in his Christian life. And I think actually one of the most important things we can do is we're committed to staying on a growth phase. We don't get stuck. And so Peter, you know the story in Acts chapter, let me see, where is this? Acts 9, Paul got saved. It's 10, 10. Is when Paul, when Peter went down, is it 10? Cornelius is there. It is 10. Went down to Cornelius' house. I've memorized every chapter of the book of Acts. I just had to chronologically catch up with myself. And, uh, but he goes down and he has this vision where God is now going to bring Christianity to the Gentiles. The only problem was that thought had never entered Peter's mind. And so Peter actually has this, this epiphany. He has this wonderful change. I now see that God is no respecter of, respecter of persons. I want to tell you, that was a growth moment in the life of Peter. It was a huge growth moment. And what will make us dull is when I'm open to new growth moments. Uh, when was the last time you genuinely, as a Christian, had an ideal, a view and a thought where God had actually allowed you to think bigger and better about something like Peter? So I want to say, we're going to make sure we keep joy in our life. And I tell you, what will make you dull more than anything else, in my opinion, is sin. Just participating in what you know to be sin. But here's another one that is almost as threatening as sin. You ready for this? No vision. Where there is no vision, the Bible says people perish. I want to tell you, we need to make sure that we take time to sharpen our edge. Amen. Here's another one that'll make you dull. Boredom. Because I want to tell you, boredom is going to get you in all sorts of trouble. If you don't keep yourself with vision and you don't keep yourself sharp and you just allow life to get boring, it will open up a world of temptation to you. My mother used to put it this way, an idle mind is the devil's playground. We need to have healthy habits that refresh us in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. 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 So what, what sharpens us? I have two thoughts real quick. Because where, where the ax is dull, how much more strength is needed? You got to put a lot more effort to get half the results. Okay, what sharpens us? I have two simple thoughts. Write these down. Number one. What sharpens us is right relationships or right friendships. It, the Bible puts it this way. Iron sharpens iron. Very good. Amen? Yeah. And I want to encourage you that I actually believe, Proverbs 27, verse 17, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. There is no doubt that whatever level of sharpness I have in my life is a result of the friendships I have. I'm in the Word, I'm in prayer, but I want to tell you what makes me sharp and what helps me stay sharp are friends. Without a doubt, this guy sitting right here on the front row, Josh Kicker, has helped keep me sharp for many years. There's been many times where I've had my thinking changed or altered or improved because of the way he saw things that I never saw them as. Sitting right here in the front row, Michael Murphy. We've been friends for, I don't know, probably 35 years. And without a doubt, I am a sharper person today because of friendships. The number one person that sharpens me is sitting right there, my beautiful wife, my bride, next year of 40 years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right friendships will sharpen you as iron sharpens iron. You notice iron cannot be sharpened unless there's more iron. Right. Right. You don't put paper with iron. Right. You've got to make sure it's iron sharpening iron. You've got to find people in your life who are iron. That's why right relationships. Amen? So what sharpens us, number one, is right relationships and right friendships. But number two is accountability. Because you can have right friends, but are you accountable? And I'm not talking like accountability, like, have you read your Bible? I mean, that's basic, that's elementary, that is so 101. I'm talking about accountability that looks like this, that you have people in your life who can point out blind spots in your life, who can spot weaknesses that you didn't know you had. I believe that'll sharpen you. I believe what makes us dull 
are the things I mentioned. But I believe what will sharpen us are the right relationships, and I believe what will sharpen us is having accountability. Somebody who can say to you, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is this tendency in you, you've got a blind spot, and you are willing to listen. Now, I gotta tell you, those people are few and far between, but there better be someone who can do that. Can you say amen? amen? I am watching somebody right now who I think is one of the greatest leaders that ever lived on planet Earth. And in the moment of challenge, friends are trying to help point out there is a blind spot. And I wanna tell you, we have to make sure that we are people, that we've got people who can speak into our life. Everybody understand this? So here's the first thought. You ready for it? We are all going to falter. The righteous man, though he falls seven times, shall rise again. The just man falls seven times. You know why he falls seven times? Because he's just a man. The just man, the righteous man. And I want to tell you, you've got to have room in your life to understand you will falter. Somebody say amen. Okay, next one. This is a depressing message so far, I know. Okay, next one. Trouble is coming. If you falter in the time of trouble. So number one, we're all gonna falter. We're all gonna trip. We're all gonna make mistakes. We're all gonna make up. We're all gonna mess up. Come on, somebody. But we're gonna get back up. We're gonna get back up. Somebody say amen. Amen. Okay, trouble is coming. Look what the Bible says, James chapter one. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I love that. Consider it pure joy. I wanna tell you, you ready for it? Trouble is coming. If you're alive and you're breathing, trouble is coming. It's on its way. It's headed to your house. It knows your address. It resides in your mind. Trouble is coming. I thought this man was a faith preacher. I'm telling you. Look what the Bible says, Job, and verse chapter five, verse seven. For man is born for trouble. As sparks fly upwards, and they do. As sparks fly upwards, man is born for trouble. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. You were born for adversity. Trouble is coming. I think the greatest times when I think I really show up in another person's life, and I think we should show up in other people's lives, and I, was, I actually think to myself, when I see a friend of mine go through adversity and he's going through hardship, going through a health crisis, maybe going through a business crisis, maybe going through a marital crisis, I honestly think the times when I shine the brightest in a person's life, and I shine bright in other times as well, but I think the moment when I think to myself, I was born for this moment, is in my friend's hard times. You see, the Bible says a brother was born for adversity. I want to be that guy that steps up and steps into another. Trouble is going to happen to all of us. And we've got to understand that, listen, adversity introduces you to yourself. You find out what manner of man you are in adversity. And I want to put it this way, Proverbs, uh, Psalm 34, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their Okay, that was your chance to shout out. And delivers them out of there. Okay, the righteous, the righteous cry. And the Lord hears. And what does the Lord do when the righteous cry? He delivers them out of there. Trouble's coming. You're in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. You are going to be in trouble. Trouble is inevitable. I know some of you aren't liking this preaching. You want to go to the other church down the road, but I'm just preaching the Bible here. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Watch, ready for this? Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. 
Come on, somebody. You will falter. You're going to get in trouble. And I honestly think I'm born for those moments. I got a friend right now, Paul Dion. There's not a day I have not interceded for that man and stormed heaven. There's probably, there isn't a week where I haven't reached out to him two or three times. I am praying for you right now. I'm thinking of you today. I'm believing God. And I trust God regardless of the outcome. I'm believing for healing. I'm believing for health. I am believing for prosperity. But you better know, I'm trusting God with you regardless of the outcome. Can somebody say amen? If you falter in the time of trouble, how small is your strength? Here's my last thought, and I'm done. You ready for this? How small is your strength? Well, how do we measure someone's strength? Well, I mean, maybe... You go to a gym, there's a guy who works out in there, and if you looked at him, dear God, he's, he's, a, he's a mountain. He's, he's, like, he's so big, and he kind of walks like, you know, his arms, he, like, he's got muscles coming out here, and it's like, he, it's like a gorilla when he walks. And, uh, you know, a couple of times, man, Steve, love to train you, I'm good. And I look at him, he's strong. Physically, he's strong. But I'm not asking about your physical strength. Paul says... It's of some value. There is value to taking care of yourself. But the question I'm asking is, how small is your strength in the Lord? How strong are you? Because I'm telling you, I've seen too many Christians give up too quick. Lose heart. Lose heart on God. Lose heart on church. Lose heart in a marriage. Lose heart in their business. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say to me, I just want to sell everything and go live in the country and just have no pressure in life. Oh, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> Listen, you take you wherever you go. So if you think I'll move to Florida and life will be better, the only problem is you're going to take you with you. And all you do is recreate the same problems you had down there as you had up here. Can I, can I just help us? to understand that actually how small is your strength? Do you think the easy option is just to get out from under all this? No, get up. Sharpen yourself. Listen, if you fall six times, get up the seventh time. Can somebody say amen? Don't, and and we, we lose heart and we lose courage too quickly. And I just think we need to, God's saying, I want to say it, God is saying, man up. So I guess my thought is, if we're going to measure strength, it'll be this. I would measure the strength of your convictions. How, how non-negotiable are your convictions? Be a good way to measure someone's strength, wouldn't it? The strength of your convictions. Well, what if no one saw you do it? Would you still do it? Remember that movie? What's that? City Slickers? I love that movie. One of the best movies ever made. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Uh, Probably, I don't know, 30 years ago. um, What's the guy's name? Billy Crystal. And he's riding on a horse. And he's with his friend. And his friend says, what if the most drop-dead, gorgeous, voluptuous woman just appeared on a spaceship? It's a little scary how well I remember the the narrative. (laughs) And, uh, And no one would ever know. And she just came beside you stark naked and she gave herself to you for a whole night. And then she got back on the spaceship and she would go and and this guy is a married man he's talking to. And he says, no one would ever know, would you do it? And I think it was Billy Crystal goes, no. And he says, the other guy says, why wouldn't you? He says, because I'd know. That's someone who's got a strength of conviction. And I want to ask you, how small is your strength? What are your non-negotiables? I've noticed a lot of Christians, when they're, back, when they're around Christians, behave like Christians. Right. Right. But when they're around non-Christians, they behave like a non-Christian. Right. How small is your strength? Right. Come on. Maybe you've got a hand-me-down revelation of what God wants us to live like. The Bible says this, in his presence, there's fullness 
of joy. Some Christians need to go back into his presence. They go, I've been in the presence of God. I'm going, dude, go back. Because I know that if you've been in his presence, you're going to have a smile on your face. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. I get it. You, you maybe are just in the outer court of his presence. You might want to go into the inner court. You might want to work toward the holy of holies because I'll know when you've seen God because you'll have joy. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Another verse says it this way. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So I don't think we measure so much strength by the muscles on their arms. I don't think we measure so much strength with, you know, how strong and authoritative they are. I actually think we measure our strength by the strength of our convictions. I think we measure our strength by the joy of the Lord. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And, and, you know, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm, I'm done. Singers, musicians, come on back. Hebrews 10 verse 38. I love this verse. But my righteous one will live by faith. And you gotta know, look at me, church. I told you, you will falter. I told you, I will falter. I told you, there will be trouble. You will have trouble. I will have trouble. Thank you for the, I know you're really not liking the message. I can tell. <laughs> Some of you aren't even taking notes. You're probably right, this guy's lost it. He's like, He's, he's depressing me. <laughs> but I am a faith preacher. And I believe in the message of faith. But faith is not denial. Faith is getting up when you've been knocked down. Come on, somebody. Faith is being that person where you know you were born for that person's adversity and you can step up and you can step into their life and you can carry them through that hard time and get them to the other side. I am your brother and I will fight with you. If you are weak, I will add my strength to your weakness and we will get through this. But look what it says. By my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. What are you shrinking back from? Whatever you're shrinking back in, God says, I take no pleasure in the one that shrinks. Oh, things are hard. Inflation, cost, rising cost of money. I can't afford to give to God's house. God takes no pleasure in the one that shrinks. I actually think this is the time to step up and give him. I think this is the time to say, God, I'm trusting you that you are Jehovah Jireh and my needs are supplied by according to your riches and your glory, not according to the NASDAQ, not according to the Dow, not according to the stock market, not according to my retirement funds, but you will supply all my needs. And if ever there was a time to be sowing, this is the time to be sowing in Jesus' name. But the righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Shrinking back on fighting for your marriage. Shrinking back on fighting for your business. Come on, somebody. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and watch are destroyed. But to those who have faith and are saved. Paul puts it this way. Sorry, I'll give you a couple of verses. Ready? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Nehemiah verse eight, chapter eight, verse 10. The joy of of the Lord is my strength. Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I've come today to tell you, church, this Proverbs 24, verse 10, tells me, don't give in. Don't give up. Don't back down. Keep on going. The righteous man, though he falls seven times, he will rise again. 
Come on, somebody. Come on. If you falter in the day of trouble, how small is your strength? Get up again. Get up again. Get up again. Get up again. Get up. If you fall down, get up. If you fall down again, get up. Get up. That's the word of the Lord. Come on. You were born for the hard times. This is your moment to shine. This is your best hour. This is your greatest moment. Your hardest trial is your greatest breakthrough. You got to believe that God is with you in the fire. You got to believe you were born to help that brother to get through that hard time. Come on. Somebody's got to get this in their spirit. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up in your soul. Get up in your spirit, man. Get up. I'm going to keep saying it until we get it. You got to get up. You got to get up. You just got to get up. Get up, man. Get up. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Ain't no one going to break up my stride. Oh, no. I got to keep on moving. Somebody needs to hear it online. Get up in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. God is speaking directly to your spirit. Get up. Come on, give God some praise if you receive the word. <laughs> I hope today you're not walking there ever going, well, I went to Wave Church and the pastor told me I'm going to fall and it's all sorts of trouble. I hope you heard your pastor say, we're all going to go through stuff, but we're going to get back up. We were born for these moments. You find out what's really in someone when you squeeze them. Isn't that true? What comes out? Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're with me. Or maybe both of those things happen. First that happens, and then you do that. Can I pray for you today? Everybody online, if this message spoke to you, I know it did. I know it did. This is, this is actually my favorite proverb of the truth be told. You're probably not supposed to have favorite proverbs. You know, but this one, no, no chapter like this chapter has been opened to me. Of any other chapter in the Bible, specific rainbow, I could, tell, I could keep you here all day and tell you just out of this chapter alone, the significant revelations God given me out, significant. Remember the time when we were trying to decide whether we buy the seven acres of land? Remember that? And then we're also trying to raise money. Tobe, you remember this. We're trying to raise money to build our epicenter, education, power and influence, our children's facility. I knew we couldn't do both at the same time. I knew that just wouldn't be practical. I knew it wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be wise. We couldn't commit to buying the $700,000 for the land and to build a $3 million building at the same time. That's tough sometimes as a leader. Leaders have to make some tough decisions about things. Are you hearing me? And not everybody understands those decisions, but it's okay. That's the price of leadership. I'm okay to live with the, that challenge. Because in the long term, I think people figure it out and say, well, that church has always made good, wise and decisions. Even we've made some bad ones, we've corrected. And I said, God, I don't know what to do because I can't. Ask the church to give to build a building and then buy land at the same time. It's too much. So God, I need to know because this piece of land, once it's sold, the opportunity to buy it again will be gone forever. And I said, God, you have to speak to me. I need a direct rhema revelation. Which one do I do first? I will not do both. And God gave me Proverbs 24, and it says, this is what it says. Finish your outdoor work. Get your fields ready. After that, build the house. <laughs> Remember that, Toby? I went, dear God, could you be more specific, please? <laughs> I had faith in that moment to buy that property. And we found a way to buy the property. We asked 20 families. 
to all give, I think, three to $5,000 a year over and above their tithe, over and above their commitment to legacy for three to five years. And if you do this, we can afford to buy the land and build it. Are you hearing me? That's how we have that today. Because iron sharpened iron. Because God, I was in the Word and the Lord gave me a Word from the Word. But you can't get a Word from the Word if you're not in the Word. If you want me to pray for you today, this message spoke to you. I hope you're still standing at home. This message spoke to you. I want you to lift both hands to heaven. I want to pray for you. Father, you see every hand, almost every hand in the building's raised. I'm asking God, let divine strength and confidence and courage come. I'm asking God for every person that maybe inwardly, maybe they're standing here in this building, but they don't feel like they're standing in their inner man. And I'm asking God for strength and faith and courage to come. I'm asking God in the name of Jesus that you would be with them, that you would put those around them that will help them stand. Lord, they will get up. I thank you, Father, for faith and confidence and courage in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. That help anybody? Come on, what would it take for you to be encouraging? Did that help anybody? Amen. I got one more thing to do, and then I'm going to give it back to Devante. I want you to look at me, every single person, everybody online. I want you to look at me. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you today. Because I talked about iron sharpens iron. I talked about a brother was born for adversity. But now I just want to say one thing. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I got two brothers. I love my brothers. One of my brothers is going through a particularly hard time right now in himself with his health. I ring him. I'm born for these moments. I will step up and I will step in. I can't always step up and step in in everybody's life. And that's why we have a team of people. So people are getting the quality and the attention and the care that's needed. But Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Maybe you don't have a brother. You don't know what it is to have a brother. Let me tell you something. Brothers are Family's tight. Jesus is closer than the tightest brother you'll ever have. He's a friend. He's not mad at you. He loves you. There is a friend. Listen to this. Listen. Who sticks closer. He will stick with you. He will stay with you. He is a friend that's closer than your closest brother. He will walk beside you. He will be with you in the good times and the bad times. He will laugh with you. He will weep with you. He bottles your tears when you cry. So precious are your tears that He holds them in a veil. And when you get to heaven, He will give you the tears you cried on earth and said, son, I was with you, brother. I was there in your darkest hour. I kept you. Do you know Jesus? Are you a Christian? Do you know what it is to be forgiven of your sins? He went to the cross and paid the price for my sin and your sin. Oh, He's closer than a brother. He sticks and I'm asking you today, do you know Jesus? Are you a Christian? And I want to pray with you and for you. If you say, Steve, I do not know Him as you speak of. You say, Steve, today I once was living for God, but I know today I need to get right with Him. I'm going to believe in God right here, right now. People are going to make a decision to give their life to Jesus. Are you ready, church? Are you ready, church? Are you believing with me, church? I want to tell you, this world's in trouble. This world is faltering and the church needs to rise up and be all that she can be. We were born for these moments. (laughs) We were born for this moment. I don't know how you came to be the church this morning. 
I don't know who brought you. Maybe you just drove by and thought, I need to go in there. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe right now life is hard and you're in trouble. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. If you say, Steve, pray for me online, I want you to click that button. Steve, include me in that prayer. I'm making the decision. Already people are making the decision online. But everybody listening to the sound of my voice, look at me as I close. Steve, pray for me. I don't know Jesus as you speak of. Steve, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Steve, pray for me. I'm away from God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And if I'm speaking to you without a hesitation, would you lift your hand and say, Steve, pray for me. I need to get right with God. I need to come back to Jesus. Quickly lift it up. That's it. Keep holding them up nice and high so I can see them. God bless you. 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 Come on, keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, up in the back. Come on, where are you today? Give me a wave if I haven't seen your hand. Already 20, 30 people. God bless you right there. 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 Their hands being raised all over the building. Church, can we give a lot of hand? Let's pray this prayer. Can we say it out loud? Hey, we were born for these moments. Can we say it out loud? Lord Jesus, I ask you today to come into my life to forgive me of my sins. I receive you now as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I am now a Christian. You now live in me. My sins are forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.